But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics, most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in US history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to breakoutswimclinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best, breakoutswimclinic.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I am really excited about today's guest. She was the first woman to break a minute in the 100-yard breaststroke, which I'm very jealous, by the way. I never did that. And uh, she was 2000 NC2A Swimmer of the Year. That same year, she got the silver medal in the Sydney Olympics, same team I was on, so very, very cool. And she's been in four Hall of Fames, inducted into four different Hall of Fames, part of eight American records and one world record. And my favorite part, she was a teacher giving back to the kids in her hometown for 14 years. And she's now a master swim instructor and master clinician and one of our most beloved Team USA ambassadors, the one and the only, a true ultimate swimmer, Christy Kowal. Welcome to the show, Christy. Ah, oh, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So you've done a lot in your swimming career, and uh, but you're, it all started in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I'm always intrigued. There was a lot of great breaststrokers out of Pennsylvania over the years. And um, so I wondered if you could kind of take us back into your childhood and kind of your foundational years. What was something good that your parents or coaches did to you that kind of set you on a trajectory for all the good things to come in the future? Oh my God. It's so funny that you say that there are so many breaststrokers. We used to joke that there was something in the water in Pennsylvania that just like, you know, Jeremy Lynn, Anita Nall, Kyle Salyers, Kristen Woodring. There were just like so many in a row. So I, I grew up very lucky to <laughs> be born in that area. But really, I think, um, you know, my childhood started like so many others in swimming is that my mom wanted us to be safe when we went to the pool. So she signed my brother and I for swim lessons. I did the mommy and me. And I absolutely loved being in the water from the first time I jumped in because I couldn't dive. So I had to jump in and, you know, I was the little kid in lane one or six. There's a, a picture of me standing on the blocks. I think at one of my first meets ever, no cap, no goggles, didn't even take my mark. I'm just standing straight up and I would have to take a couple strokes and then hang on to the side of the pool and my coaches would be yelling at me to keep going. And I was trying to go as far as I could. And I would have to stop like 10 times before I got back uh, to the other end. My mom sent a picture of me swimming backstroke uh, to me this month. And it honestly looks like active drowning. Like, <laughs> the only thing, it looks like my little arm is reaching out, like help me, somebody come in and get me. But I just, I loved it so much that I just wanted to do it all the time. I got to hang out with my friends. I was at the pool. It was the best. Yeah. And all of us got started that way. And that's so cool that you, uh, you know, enjoyed from a young age, just being in the water. And I, when, when I tell parents, I says, you, you just got to get them comfortable and learn through play. And then if you can do summer league and enjoy those little races and those little moments, that's everything. Exactly. Um, 
So did, did you have a meet or a year or a season where you thought, okay, I'm getting pretty good at this. Uh, this might be my sport. Well, oh my know? gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember coming home from the pool, I think I was 10 and the Olympics were on TV and my parent and I was like, wait, wait, you get to swim on TV. No, this is amazing. You get a cap with your name on it. Like I want to do that. And I was still this little kid that was just not good, not good at all. And my parents were like, Oh, so you know, you have to be really good. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. And so <laughs> I was like, I want to be a teacher too. Mom's was like, Oh, thank God. She's got a second plan. But I, I wanted to become an Olympian from the first time I ever saw, you know, Summer Sanders and Janet Evans on the TV. And, um, it really wasn't I think my, one of my coaches, Helen, who also gave me lessons growing up, uh, she got interviewed in one of my hall of fame inductions and she called me, she was like, yeah, Christy was not the person we would have picked to go to the Olympics. She was actually pretty dopic in the water, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I figured it out over time. Um, it wasn't really until probably high school that I started improving and getting better, uh, even at 12 years old. So our YMCA had so many people on the team that they had to split us up into different groups. And it's kind of like a, it's like grades. So if you're on the A team, you got the best grade. I was on the C team and it was like a needs improvement group. And I remember asking my coach, like, Randy, can I be on the A team with my friends? He was like, oh, no, not yet. I'm like, he said, yeah, there's hope. <laughs> like, one day. <laughs> the power of yet. There's one day I could be there too. But it really, it wasn't until high school that, you know, when I was 12, I thought I was a butterflyer because I grew up watching Summer Sanders. I'm like, yes, I'm going to be like Summer. And then I realized, you know, when I was 13, you have to swim four laps of butterfly. And no one wanted to see that. So... <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that is how I became a breaststroker. I decided I could not make four laps of butterfly. Even in college, Jack would laugh when he put me in the hundred fly. Like, let's see it. She's gonna break the. Is she gonna break her breaststroke time with her fly? Probably not. So, <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> but yeah, it it really was. It wasn't until high school, and um, you know, I was one of those kids that I was on the team. I was a freshman, and I was swimming behind all of my friends. And you know, you touch people's feet in front of you, and um you have one of two things to do. You can either like pass them and go faster, or you can just hope they don't get mad at you. And you just tell them, Oh, I'm so sorry. Keep going. And I was the person that was like, no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. Just keep going in front of me. And our, co my coaches saw that and they moved me into the lane next to my friends with the big, older, hairy, scary guys. And they were not happy to have me in their lane. <laughs> and they basically told me, they're like, Koal, you better stay out of our way or we're going to run you over. And they meant it. They meant that they were going to physically grab me, pull me behind them and just like sail over me. So, you know, for two hours every day, I'm in survival mode trying to swim as fast as I could, but I kind of made the connection that the harder you work, the faster you start to go. Yeah, it does. It does pay off. That hard work does pay <laughs> off. There is a direct correlation. Well, we, we had an animal lane at our high school group too, and it toughens you up. And, you know, if you want to go to the next level, that's what you got to do. But I, I love how... <laughs> I love how at 10 years old, though, you kind of had a vision of being an Olympian and a teacher. And you just had a nice, steady progression of keep showing up, keep doing the little things right, keep pushing yourself. And, and it, so it seems like that ability to go through pain barriers and to tough it out and, you know, getting that grit kind of started. You started honing that in high school. And um, what at, towards the end of high school, so you obviously got some looks from different colleges. What was that process like for you? What, what were the colleges you looked at? How did you ultimately pick Georgia? Yeah, so it was crazy. So I made my first, um, when I was a junior, I won high school states and found out that you know, the, that summer I qualified, it was when you could qualify short course to make long course nationals. And I found out that I had qualified for U.S. nationals and being from Pennsylvania, hearing that it was in Pasadena, California, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> so um, I was a very young jun uh, junior into my senior. I was 16 the summer uh, before my senior year. And so all of these things really happened at the same time. I went to my first nationals. I ended up um, getting second place at my first ever U.S. that we used to call it the senior nationals. So I went to senior nationals for the first time. I made my first international competition. I made Pam Packs in 1995. I actually tried to turn it down because I didn't have any friends on the team and didn't know anyone. So <laughs> there's the managers like not understanding 
<laughs> why someone's turning down being on the U.S. national team and going to Pan Pax until I finally spilled it that I was afraid I wouldn't have any friends. And that is actually where I met Jack Bowerly. He was in charge of the brushstrokers for the Pan Pacific Championships in Atlanta. And I had already made decisions to go on four recruiting trips. I was going to go see Stanford, Tennessee, Florida, Texas, and I had left one open through the summer just to kind of go to nationals, feel it out, meet some coaches. And I came home from Pan Pax and I told my parents, I said, that's it. I found my fifth trip. I'm going to go to Georgia. And my parents just looked at me because we're very new to the swimming world. Uh, we had no idea what was happening, and we didn't even know if Georgia had a pool. <laughs> so we had to break out the Swimming World magazine and look at the college rankings. And then my dad picked out this massive book of all the colleges in the uh, in the country and said, oh, my gosh, they have a really good college of education program. So he's like, okay, you can take a trip to Georgia. And I took those trips one after another after another, and Georgia was my last one. And even if you talk to Jack now, he said that he figured that there was no way in this world after my recruiting trip that I was going to Georgia because it was one of those, I mean, back in the time before cell phones, (laughs) my mom put me on an airplane, 16 years old, hop on an airplane, fly from Reading, Pennsylvania to Philly, Philly to Charlotte, Charlotte to Athens, except for on the way from Reading to Philly, there was a fo- there was like a huge fog. Um, they had to turn us around, land us back in Reading. They ended up putting me on a flight to Philly and told me to figure out when I got to Philly. I'm like, oh, I'm only wow. 16. And so there was no, so I keep hopping on these planes. There's no record of me anywhere on the U.S. air uh, in their database. So Harvey Humphreys, the assistant from Georgia, just kept showing up at the Athens airport every single time a plane would land from wherever to see if I had been on that plane. <laughs> so I made it. I think it takes 12 hours to drive from where I live in Pennsylvania to Georgia, and it took 15 hours to fly. <laughs> I got there. It was a homecoming weekend. They lost my suitcase. I'm borrowing clothes from all the girls on the team. I'm exhausted. And I remember my host, Sarah Miller, who ended up being my big sister on the team. She asked me, she's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to like a hayride? Do you want to go to a movie? And I looked at her. I said, could I please just go to sleep? (laughs) And she she let me go to sleep. And I said, this is it. I found my home. Like I can serve, I can be a great swimmer, survive and sleep. That's um, perfect. Yeah, that I was love really, that story. It, it was getting to, it was just getting to the different teams and feeling, you know, even, you know, the Georgia dynamic now is, is always changing. It's different than when I was there. So you have to go to the team and experience the coaches, experience the campus, meet with the advisors, you know, hang out with the team and just find the place that feels like home for you. And I think I really felt that when I got to Georgia, it felt like home. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. During that Pasadena nationals in 95, I was there and I hit a big slump and I didn't make the A team to go to Pan Pax with you guys at the Atlanta Olympic pool. And I was really bummed. I made the, I think I made the B team. The B team was going to world university games in Japan. And so, um, I was, I was thinking about not going either. Cause I was so mad that I didn't make the A team. And so I was just talking to some friends or my family and I said, Hey, I'm just going to go for fun. And, um, Oh, I remember now. Yes. Chantel and I had just gotten married. And so, uh, you know, being a newlywed, I was like, well, maybe I don't want to go. So I could just hang out at home with Chantel. And and then at the last minute, we decided that I would go to Tokyo or to Japan. And so we made the B team and went to Japan, had a blast, had a absolute blast. And the World University Games is is really a fun group because it's just all college group, college people. And uh, we really bonded well. And it's so funny that you were on the A team and I was on the B team, but you were the, (laughs) you, you were, you were very shy back then. Oh my gosh. I know people don't believe when I say that I was shy. I was terrified of everything. I was afraid to go to, you know, the breakfast room by myself. And then my roommate ended up, Jessica Fashi ended up leaving the meet. So then here I am all by myself in a hotel room in downtown Atlanta, trying to figure out when I'm supposed to get the bus to go over to my event. (laughs) I had no idea. And you know who took me under their wing? BJ Bedford. (laughs) She would come to my room, check on me 
me. I think she even like showed up in my room in a pair of flippers, a cap on sideways, goggles in her bathing suit, and like was spraying shaving cream at me. I'm like, this is my this is my introduction to the U.S. national swimming team. <laughs> yeah, BJ will introduce you to everybody and show you how to have a good time. Exactly. Oh, that's amazing. So, you, but you're on the national team and you're starting to get to know everybody. And now we get to the 96 Olympic trials in March of 96. And (laughs) I remember when I was there in 92, I just missed the team. And I remember walking around the locker rooms and the deck and there's just this incredible just ratio of dream to disappointment. It's like every one person that gets a dream, there's like 200 people that are just really upset and really mad and really (laughs) down. And it's just, you can just cut the tension with a knife. It's just so thick. Uh, so much is riding on the line. And I remember going to 96 thinking, okay, this is, this is my year. I can do this. And thankfully I got second and I did it. Um, and you became famous in 96 for just missing it. And yep. it's terrible enough because all of us, you know, that get to know each other, we know each other's hurting. And, but then you had the privilege of being on the cover of Swimming World magazine oh, yeah. <laughs> for the whole world to see the, uh-huh. the, the disappointment. And because they had, that was like, the dream to disappoint. The agony, yeah. the agony and the ecstasy, they called it. <laughs> and, you, and you got to be the agony woman. Yeah. It was, you know, Olympic trials is you hit the nail on the head. You can cut the tension with a knife. And I don't think I really ever understood that saying until I got to the Olympic trials in 96. And it's, you know, all the people that I had met the summer before and my friends, everybody is just so focused and so nervous. And so it isn't, it's not one of those meets where you can almost go alone and, um, you know, I saw it in a different light four years later when I went with my college team and had a team surrounding me. I was essentially there by myself in 96 and it was terrifying. Like when I do clinics and when I talk to to kids, I'm, I'm like, they're like, what's Olympic trials like? I said, well, it's a little different now. Now it's a show and fire comes out of the ground while people are swimming. I'm like, when I swam, it was the scariest place on earth. Like I need you to imagine the scariest place on earth. And that was Olympic trials. And it was, it was just the pool and it was very sterile and it was very cold. and you know, I only had one shot. I was only swimming the hundred brush stroke. And two weeks earlier, I had broken the national high school record at our district state meet. And I did it or our district meet. And um, I didn't get to go to high school states because Pennsylvania somehow decided that they were going to schedule state championships the same weekend as Olympic trials. I even wrote a letter petitioning the state, like, why would you do that? And they oh, said, oh, wow. sorry, you're the only one in this situation. <laughs> so you just don't get to swim state your senior year. <laughs> Like, oh. but thank you for your letter. And I was like, okay, great. Wow. Um, so I did. I went to. I went to. High, I went to Olympic trials, and my family was there. And um, you know, I never really remember a ton about my races. I just remember after prelims, I had uh, qualified, and I think I was back in third place. And I just kept remind, like thinking to myself, don't get third, don't get third, don't get third. Like this is not the place you want to get third at. And I dove in, and I you know, back in the day, I used to just swim as fast as I could on the first lap and try not to die on the second lap, which is terrible. It's like a terrible way to swim a race. And so I'm out in front, I'm swimming, I'm pulling and kicking as hard as I can. And when I hit the wall, I counted to five and I turned around and I saw a third place behind my name Mm. and my heart just sunk. I climbed out of the water. I just, a a couple of people tried to like pat me on the shoulder and I just, I don't even remember. And I just sat down on the side of the, uh, the diving well, which is directly behind the competition pool. And my parents were across the pool, uh, looking at me screaming, like, we love you. Great job. And I'm just like, yay. I love you, boo. (laughs) No. (laughs) And you know, I was 17 years old. So I was doing what any 17 year old do. I was devastated. And the worst part about it is, you know, you go and you get third place at the Olympic trials and now you're an alternate. So should anyone get sick or hurt? (laughs) You get to go. So they do the drug. So they take you into the room and drug testing. So now you're sitting there an alternate. You didn't make the team. You're as sad as you possibly can be. And there are the two happiest people on the earth because they just made the Olympic team and you're in the room with them. And it was just so it's, it's hard for someone that young to process. And, you know, it's, that quote, it's like, you can't always connect the dots looking forward. Um, 
but you can only connect them looking backward. Yeah. And, you know, you have to consider all of the different stories that go along, you know, uh, my story is that I got third, but then on the other hand, who beat me for second place was Christine Quans, who the night before had been disqualified in the 400 IM. So, you know, there's all of these storylines that are kind of intermixing that make the difference between if you make it or not. And the thing that killed me is that, you know, Swimming World didn't just put me on the cover. They put me on the cover with Christine who beat me for second. It wasn't even Amanda who got first or Uh-oh. someone else. I was like, oh, I saw Christine a couple of weeks ago and she was so sweet. She's such a lovely, like lovely woman. And she's like, Christy, it's been a long time. Do you remember me? I'm like, yeah, I remember you. I know you at every clinic I give. That's right. Y'all are linked together forever. We're linked forever. Uh, but it did. It was so, that was just, that was hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that would make like a great reality TV show to kind of be able to see what it's like, you know, just after the race in the drug testing room, you know, try, yep. trying to m- manage your emotions and feelings and talk that out with your coaches and parents. I mean, it's intense. It's intense. Do you know what happened? So then I don't make the team and the Olympics were just, you know, I think two or three months later, cause it was March. Yeah. March. So yep. uh, the Olympics were that summer and our local news crew decided that they wanted to come film me in my home, watching the hundred brushstroke <laughs> at the Olympics. Just to add in, insult to injury. I was like, oh. why? I was like, why <laughs> would you do that? And I think the hardest thing is, you know, that time when I missed the team, my time from Olympic trials, because you have to look back on it. Cause you know, when you get out of a race and you miss something like that, it's devastating. And you think everything just had to have gone horribly. And then looking back on it, hindsight, I did the best time. So it's all about, you know, I couldn't have controlled what anybody else in that race did. I went a best time and it took me a long time to figure that out, that that wasn't a bad race for me, but that time would have actually won me a medal in Atlanta. Oh my. Do you remember, do you remember, (laughs) do you remember your exact time from trials? Oh gosh. I think it was a one Oh eight, eight 87. I think. Yeah. Just, I think so. Yeah, just to give people some context out there, you know, for, for swimmers who are listening now and just getting what, you know, what the times were back then. Because you made, so do you remember your time from 95 when you made Pan Pax? What's your t- it was a 109, I think. Well, that's good. So you, so you dropped a second the next, right. the next yeah. year. So that was huge. And I mean, I was training with my... Again, look, you know, that hindsight is 2020 is that I went home and I was training with my high school and we did really hard practices. Don't get me wrong, but I was only swimming once a week, uh, once a day. Um, I was lifting very, very lightly. It was more of like an introduction to lifting. Um, I wasn't really doing a ton of dry land. It was looking back. I can now see, you know, how I got uh, third place in 96 was actually pretty darn impressive considering when I got to college and saw just how much training was going to step up for me. So I'm pretty proud of myself now that I can look back at it. Back then it was the worst thing in the world, <laughs> but right. you know, looking, looking back on it, I'm like, wow, once a day <laughs> practicing. And I made third, I got, I was an alternate on the Olympic team. That is impressive. That is impressive. So, um, you go to Georgia and you get established there and you're, you're training with Jack Roach and I, 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 uh, Jack Bowerly. Jack, sorry, Jack Bowerly. Yeah, and yeah. I was talking to Jack Bowerly earlier and he gave me some, some stories on you and, oh, um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so he, he said that you were an incredibly hard worker and just a, a super leader. And ultimately you and Courtney doing this unbelievable job leading the team. Uh, you know, you're, y'all's, uh, as you were upperclassmen towards the end. Um, but he, he told me about a race, a 200 IM and, uh, I think you won. And, but he said after the race, how'd you feel? And he says, I can't feel my hands or my face. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh my gosh. I mean, I have to look at the overall picture of just like how far I came at Georgia. Like my first Saturday morning practice at Georgia, I called my parents and told them to come get me. I was not <laughs> division one material. I was like, you know, I was like, mom, you don't understand. I was like, I swim for four hours and then I, I ran a mile with a 12 pound ball. And then I had to run around a field. I hid in the bushes, Josh. <laughs> my first Saturday practice, I found it was like a baseball field and I hid behind the dugout in the bushes. And all I hear as I'm hiding is Steve Boltman's voice <laughs> from above me, just like Christy, 
you have to keep running. And I figured if I didn't look at him, he couldn't see me. So <laughs> it was like toddler syndrome. I was like, I'm not going to look at him. <laughs> so I did. I kept running. And then one of the seniors grabbed me. She's like, come on, Christy, I'll be your dry land partner. And she dropped the 12 pound ball on my face. like <laughs> dry land. So I called my parents I'm like, you've got to come back here. And they told me, they said, sweetie, we love you so much. But we just drove you 12 hours down and we drove 12 hours back. So you're going to you're gonna need to figure this one out on your own. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I did. And, you know, it's funny because the next year I was the person who found the person standing or, you know, hiding in the bushes during dry land. <laughs> but it's like I came. I came so far while I was there. But, yeah, that 200 IM, that was at NCAAs. And that was the year they changed it. In 2000, they changed it to shore course meters. And it was the first day. And my face with... 15 meters to go on the freestyle length. Just to put it in perspective, my fly was okay. My backstroke in an IM was about the same time as my breaststroke. And <laughs> I hit the wall in eighth place after backstroke. And I did the t- open, t- or I did the crossover turn and look up and people are already swimming breaststroke as I'm just streamlining off the wall. Oh my. I was like, Oh gosh, I have a lot of work to do. And I did. I had a lot, but thank goodness it was short course meter. So I had a little bit longer <laughs> to catch people. And freestyle was just like anything you had left, you just gave it. And with 15 meters to go, my face just went numb. I could not figure out if I was taking a breath anymore. Uh, so I just figured I should just put my head down and hit the wall. And I got out of the water and Jack's like, why aren't you more excited? And I said, I can't feel my face. <laughs> he pats me on the shoulder and tells me I have 15 minutes until the 400 medley relay. So I should probably just go warm down. Oh, my. <laughs> All right, let's do this one more. <laughs> oh, I'm so impressed, though, that you won the 200 IM. I mean, that's huge. Whew. That's huge. It was it was. I loved the 200 IM. Even, you know, in 2000, they switched the order of events. So I think I was third or fourth fourth place going into trials in the 200 IM, but it was the same day as the 100 breaststroke. Again, hindsight, I wish I would have tried the 200 IM instead of the 100 breaststroke. Oh, wow. That is interesting. That is interesting. I love that. <clears throat> um, so, you get NC two A woman. Oh, by the way, I meant to ask you when 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 did you break a minute for the first time? As of the first. Oh, so yeah. So back in the old days, yeah. <laughs> when we didn't have tech suits, we didn't have tech suits, and we definitely did not have a dolphin kick on the underwater pullout that was considered cheating. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I did that at the Georgia Invite. My. I oh no no, no. I broke the first, my first American record at the Georgia Invite. My um, sophomore year, I had tonsillitis. It was right before World Championships in 98. And so then that uh, spring at NCAAs in 1998, I ended up breaking a minute. Okay, that's right. That's right. Now, but at 98, when we were at Worlds, you had a good meet. You, oh, yeah. Because, yeah, you, you won the 100 breasts, and we were all like, Christy, that's awesome. <laughs> No one was more surprised than me. So we get to world championships and the open water swimmers were bringing their medals and showing us. And then they showed us those cool Australian hats. Yes. And I wanted a hat. Like <laughs> I wanted the hat. And so swimming in the 100 brushstroke, um, I was swimming the 100 and the 200. And if I did well in the 100, I got to swim the 400 medley relay. And I just remember swimming in in the morning and there was so much controversy like when we got there and I tried my best to just kind of, you know, not look in the media and not read the newspapers, but the brushstroker from China that I was supposed to compete against ended up not being able to enter the country because they caught her with uh, vials of human growth hormones. And so there was so much like extra going on at that meet that I just kind of made sure that I kept my, my tunnel vision on. I was just worried about myself and what I wanted to do, which was win a hat. And so (laughs) I swam in prelims of the hundred and did pretty well. And then I ended up making qualifying and I was in lane two. So I was in an outside lane and everybody was really watching those middle lanes and they had Sam Riley. So we're in Australia and Samantha Riley is like the national hero. Penny Haynes is in that heat. You know, you got the Olympic gold medalist and you have, you know, the, everybody that I basically had watched two years before at the Olympics. And all I can think is, okay, this is a place you're allowed to get third. Like you can get a hat. <laughs> <laughs> and I dove in and I swam my heart out, uh, pulling and kicking as hard as I could the last couple strokes. I'm going to hit the wall, counted to five. 
And I looked for third place immediately to see if I got a hat and I didn't see my name there. So I started going down the list, like fourth, fifth, sixth. I'm like, where's my name? Seventh. I didn't do so well. Eighth. My name's not there. Did I get disqualified? And all of a sudden I heard coach Schulberg from Germantown Academy, who I was training with in the summer times yelling, Chris, and I'm like, I see my name at, and I hear the Australian commentator say, your new world champion, Christy Cowell. I'm like, Cowell, Koa, I'm the only Christy here. Oh my God, I won. And I just started screaming, oh my God. I was like, no way did I win that race. I could not believe it. Like, could not believe it. So I remember them rushing me off and you get your award and you go to the drug testing room and I called my parents and woke them up and it's the middle of the night and I just start yelling, I got a hat, I got a hat. And they're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. I was like, oh, I won. But standing on that podium, you know, there's nothing like standing on a podium and hearing the American um, national anthem play. It's just, first of all, you're trying to remind yourself of the words so you don't look like like, because you know you know the words every time except for when they're playing and there's a camera on right right but just thinking oh my gosh if I would have ever given up on myself two years ago and just quit swimming I would not be standing here right now and so the next day in the newspaper and words because you know how the Australian newspapers are they're very um almost like tabloids and in words two inches high it said Koal didn't win others just lost and I was like oh <laughs> that one's not going in the scrapbook <laughs> like, those, oh, well. those, those Aussie journalists can be terrible they're brutal they're so brutal mean. brutal yeah so that was that was awesome. I ended up getting second place in the 200 brushstroke. Got another hat, and my favorite race out of all of the races in in Perth, I got to be on the medley relay with Dave Loveless and Jenny Thompson and uh, Amy Van Dyken, who I all I idolized all of them. And I was all I could tell myself is like, do not mess this up for them. <laughs> like, do not. <laughs> You have one job. Don't mess it up. And I ended up, I think I got out of the water and I look up at Amanda Adkins, who was there swimming the backstroke and she was from Georgia and she put a number two up and I'm like, what? And she said, second fastest ever. I was like, oh my God. So I'd gone the second fastest split ever and I got another hat and we almost broke the world record. Uh, so it was just, that was, a, that was the best meet ever. But of course, you know, back then you couldn't take any prize money. So I came home from the meet and I remember this contract like laying on Jack's desk and he said, come on, Chris, it's time for you to sign away. And what was, you know, eventually a very tenured teacher salary sitting on the table that I had to sign away. But I knew, you know, I had committed to go to Georgia for four years and that's where I was training and I was a part of the team. So there was never really a question in my mind what to do. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. And not many people are faced with that situation. Do you take the money or do you stay in school? And it is a hard one. And and, yeah. and for some folks, the money is good enough to, to uh, stop college early. But, um, but I, I, I just so appreciate your spirit of giving back to your college team and helping your team um, in continued success at Georgia. But I, I, I had a blast at that Perth meet as well. I didn't swim very well, but it was so neat to be in that city and to be in that country because Perth is the most, I guess it's the largest, uh, most remote city in the world. Um, it's the largest city that's the furthest away from another large city. And... Uh, do you remember going to that crocodile farm uh, behind our hotel? Oh my gosh! Yes, that, that cro- yes, I they do. They were like dinosaurs. They were freaking huge. Do you remember they asked somebody? They looked at, <laughs> so they were like, "We're going to feed the crocodile." Remember the huge one that had to be in its own pool because it only had three legs because a female crocodile had bit its leg off, and it, then it went and like took down all the females in the lake. Oh wow! And they look at me and they were like, "You're going to feed it," and I'm like, "Wait, what?" And they said, "Yeah, you're going to throw you know a chicken that you buy at the grocery yep. store." And they're like, "Yeah, you just throw the chicken." you know, at the pool where the crocodile is. And then you have to jump over the six, six foot high fence. I'm like, wait, what? No. <laughs> like, if you know swimmers, you know that we are not coordinated on the land. So that crocodile is going to have a six foot tall chicken, <laughs> me. And that, and this is not going to bode well for anyone. 
<laughs> I remember that. Yep. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, I just could not believe how big those crocodiles were. I was just blown away. They looked like dinosaurs, I swear. But it was always so much fun swimming in Australia too, because that energy, they love swimming there. And so, you know, you go there and you feel like a rock star and there's I remember there was a band playing and I think that was really the first time I had ever swam in a pool that was inside a stadium. And there were 10,000 people just like surrounding us. I always loved the energy um, in Australia. When yeah, I it was awesome. that Perth stadium was wonderful. And then of course the next year, 99 Pan Pax was in the Sydney stadium that they had just finished getting ready for kind of a dress rehearsal for us the next year in 2000. So we actually got to go three years in a row, 98, 99, and 2000. So that, that yep. was a really fun, uh, run of, of events going to Sydney or going to Australia three years in a row. Um, yeah. so give us, give us some behind the scenes scoop of what it was like in Sydney, Australia. Um, and what were some of the ups and downs for you that, that week at that Olympics? Oh my gosh. So, you know, you go back, it, you always hear the saying that lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. And so I walked back into Olympic trials in 2000, just thinking, okay, I already got a third place out of my way. Like fate cannot be so cruel (laughs) to give me another third place. And so I was on top of the world. I was the defending world champion. I was the American record holder in the short course, hundred breast, um, and in the 200 breast. And so I had a lot of confidence going into trials, but it was in the same pool It was in the, you know, it was in the same atmosphere. This time I had my Georgia teammates who, I mean, all credit goes to them. I think you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. So every day I had the best people in the world just pushing me to get better and to get better and to get better. And I got to Olympic trials in 2000 and everything, all of that kind of just, I let the ner- my nerves just take over. Um, even though I'd just been at that pool a couple minutes, a couple months earlier for NCAAs and had a great meet. And they had changed everything into prelim, semifinals, finals. So now you have to swim three times to make your event. And I did well in prelims. I did well in finals and then I, or semifinals. And I got to finals of the Hunter brushstroke and my nerves just took over. I was that person that had to be behind the blocks dancing and waving. And I remember Jack told me afterwards, he said that he looked at the assistant coaches and saw me behind the blocks. And he said, I didn't think you were breathing. And he was just like, oh no, (laughs) this is not going to be good. And I stood up and I dove in and I swam as fast as I possibly could and hit the wall and turned around and saw third again. And it was by (laughs) 0.01, it was like one one hundredth of a second. I was like, and I wanted to have the two-year-old temper tantrum. I wanted to jump out of the pool and be like, no, I'm not even tired. Like we do this again. And I look over at Jack and just said, I said, what do I do? And he's like, get out of the pool. I mean, who wants to be on the cover of Swimming World a second time (laughs) crying, right? (laughs) I like jump out of the pool. And the first person I really saw before I even saw Jack was uh, Schulberg and he grabbed me by his shoulders and he looked me square in the eye and he, he like gave me not like, he just gave me a little hug and a little shake. And he looked at me, he goes, it's not cancer kid. You're going to be fine. And I kind of put it into perspective. I was like, okay, it's not the end of the world. But Jack pulled me into that back hallway and Indy. And I was just like, come on, not again. So then you have to go through the whole thing again. You have to go through the drug testing. And I'm sitting in the drug testing room on the phone. And the drug testers are like, ma'am, you can't be on the phone. And I looked at them. I was like, I got third again. And they're like, okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. And I'm talking to my friend. And my friend's trying to cheer me up. And she's telling me how she had just hit her future in-law's car with hers. And I'm like, okay, touche. <laughs> and now I'm drunk drawing on the drug testing paper. They're like, ma'am, you can't draw on the paper. I'm like, I got third. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I I go back to the hotel. My parents are trying, they're like, come on, let's go to dinner. I'm like, I don't want to go to dinner. So I, I, to this day will never eat. I cannot eat Buca de Beppo ever. Cause Jack hands me this plate of Buca de Beppo pasta. I carry it up to my room. I get to my hotel room and I realize Courtney Shealy, who was my roommate, just made the team in the hundred backstroke. So she's out celebrating with her family and she had the key to the room. Oh no! <laughs> so I'm just sitting in front of the, I'm sitting in front of my room, tears just dripping into my pasta until Carol Capitani walks by. She's like, uh, do you need help? I'm like, yeah, I help me please. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, you have, you have a big choice to make. If you have another event, it's like, okay, well how, 
how am I going to let this affect me? Like, what am I going to do? Is this the end of my story or am I going to fight back? And I went to the pool the next day and I was really sad and really upset. And everybody wants to tell you how sad they are for you. And then I started getting mad. I was like, no, I did not work this hard to get, you know, miss the Olympics again and watch it from my couch. Uh, So by the time the 200 rolled around, I was pumped. I was ready to go. And then right before finals, started getting nervous again, like started freaking out. So they snuck my six foot seven brother down on pool deck, which is, (laughs) he kind of sticks out, but there's swimmers are tall. So that's good. And so he was sat aside of me in the stands. And every time I started freaking out and getting really nervous uh, and saying, what if I get third? He would just be like, Hey, so do you want to go to a movie tomorrow? I'm like, what? No. (laughs) Or I'm like, I'm like, Oh my God, but if I don't make the team, he's like, so where do you want to go to dinner tonight? I'm like, what are you doing? Like, he's like, just go do your job. So Press hookers are different. We're a different breed and we know it. Like you go to the ready room of a 50 free and they're standing there like growling at each other, like glaring at each other. I get to the ready room for the 200 breast and everybody's dancing, like dancing around (laughs) and we're having fun and everybody's saying good luck to each other. And we marched out and this time I was smiling and waving at my parents and it was just a whole different ball game. I was ready and I dove in and I think I remember with like 15 meters to go, I realized no one was on either side of me and everybody was behind me and I started crying while I was swimming. And then I started choking while I was swimming and I was like, (laughs) I'm going to drown before I hit the wall. Stop crying. And I hit the wall and I just, everybody in the entire heat just came over to Amanda in my lane and we were throwing the biggest party in the pool. The officials are trying to get us out of the water. They're like, girls, girls, you have to get out of the pool. We're like, no, we don't. <laughs> like, no, you do. <laughs> There's other events and we're like, we don't care. So they finally pull us out of the pool and I'm going over and they tell me I have to get interviewed. And then all of a sudden I see my brother breaking through security, running at me. And I see security running after my brother (laughs) and my brother jumps on me and security jumped on us. And, uh, I was like, I know him, I know him. So they, they told him there's this epic picture that my mom took of this from the stands. And he's standing there with this like smug look on his face with his arm around me. And I'm being interviewed and he's like, (laughs) but it's like, you know, you, you work so hard to make the Olympic team that I had no idea what I wanted to do afterwards. Like I had no clue. I had never really thought of it because I had never allowed myself to focus past trials. Um, so I always, you know, thought getting to the Olympics, you know, that was my dream. That was my goal. Because once you're an Olympian, you're always an Olympian, uh, getting a medal would kind of be the icing on the cake. So I was like, well, it'd be kind of cool to get a medal, but even if I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I made it. I finally yeah. made it. <laughs> well, praise God, your brother was there to help calm your nerves. And, and, <laughs> right? and how cool is that that he came to celebrate with you afterwards? Because moments, like that, moments yeah. like that are way better when you've got family and friends to share it with. For sure. Oh, yeah. For sure. For uh, sure. Those are some incredible <laughs> stories. Yeah. What were you going to say? Oh my gosh. No, I was going to say, so even like just getting, you said about the Olympics, like everybody's asks, like, it's so hard, you know, it's so hard to put the Olympics into, into words, like what it's like. And I always just imagine, I, you know, I tell little kids, I'm like, okay, what's your favorite place on earth? For me, it's Disneyland. And it's like getting to go to Disneyland when there's no lines, everything's free and you can ride the rides as many times as you want. That's what the Olympics felt like to me. It was just like the happiest place on earth. It was just so much fun. And, you know, it was a bummer that I didn't get to swim the hundred brush stroke. It was hard watching it, but because I didn't swim till the fifth day, I got to march in opening ceremonies, which was just epic. Yeah. I am jealous. You got to do that because my 200 free was always the first day. So I never, I never yep. had to do opening ceremonies. And so many people say that was one of the most impactful, powerful moments of their Olympic experience was getting to march out yep. all dressed up for your country. And, um, I'm so glad you got to do that. So, and, uh, and it, again, Australia was great because we're more famous in Australia than we were in America because they love swimming so much. Oh my gosh. They love swimming so much. <laughs> so and, much. Um, it's like, they, you know, they know your name. You're walking down the street and they're just like, Hey, Christy. I'm like, um, do I know you? I know. <laughs> like, no, but good on you. That's right. That's right. Good day, mate. And, uh, they, they, they would just talk about swimming. Like we talk about football, baseball, and basketball. Like they just, they knew all our yeah. names. They knew all our stat, stats. Yeah. It was uh, hilarious. It's like, you know, and this is pre Michael Phelps era. So it's, you know, it was baby Michael, but you know, they've got pictures of swimmers on the side of buildings. 
that was nothing that any of us had ever seen before. And we're just like, oh my gosh, we have arrived. Yeah, <laughs> it was this cool altered universe where swimmers were it, you know, and uh, it, it was fun. It was a great city to host an Olympics. The people are just wonderful people, throw great parties and all near the beach and the Sydney <laughs> Opera House. I mean, what great backdrops and that beautiful Olympic pool was un, unreal. Probably the best in the world. Oh best in, in the world. My favorite. Oh, it, and it was amazing. But my favorite part of it is, do you remember the the lazy river and the, and the slides and everything yes. behind in the warm down pool? Oh my gosh. Anytime Jack couldn't find me, that's where I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was warming down a slide. <laughs> warming down a few laps, going down a slide, warming down a few laps, going down a slide. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was a cool swim center and, uh, man, I just, I just loved it. Yeah. Cause I remember we'd, we'd uh, be warming down in that warm down pool and then catch a few laps in the lazy river or a slide. And, <laughs> and you could watch, you could watch on the television screens, the other Olympic events going on around the city. And yep. I remember watching the triathlon on, anyway, it's just, it's just, just cool. Just so fun. And what, what do you remember about that 200 breast race, um, set us up for, for how oh, that went down? Man. You know, it's so funny because I've watched, you know, several Olympics now and I love Rowdy. I love him so much, but I remember him one time being like, Oh, maybe somebody, you know, this I, it might've been like Ryan Lochte. He's like, Oh, he's going to save his energy for the finals. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> like, you know, you get to the Olympics and you have to swim as fast as you possibly can every single race. And because if you don't make it out of prelims into semifinals, you don't make semifinals, you don't make it to finals. There's no chance of competing. Um, so I just remember diving in and just swimming as hard as I possibly could in prelims and doing a pretty solid time for my, my prelim race. And, uh, you know, I, I qualified second place out of everyone. So I was in the first heat, you know, like even numbers, two, four, six, eight, up to 16. So I'm in the first heat, odd numbers get to swim in the second heat. So I don't know if it's, I'd be very interested to find out if it's ever happened, but even in that first heat, I guess you could actually get first place in the first heat, but if eight people beat you in the second heat, you don't make it to final. So I just swam for my life <laughs> in that semifinal heat. And I got out and I walked over to the side of the pool and I stood with the manager and I watched Amanda swim. And I was like, go Amanda, everyone else slow down, go Amanda, everyone else slow down. And then I qualified to come back fourth. Um, and so, you know, at the Olympics, there's no uh, sneaking your brother anywhere. Right. <laughs> like it's hard enough to get on the Olympic, onto the pool deck yourself with your credential. But the coolest thing, you know, I remember warming up and knowing that that night, Team USA, because they, they alternate where you get to sit every single night so that sometimes you're in the stand, sometimes you're on the left side of the pool, the right side of the pool, or the far end. But that night, Team USA was going to be a side of lane eight, and I was going to be swimming in lane six. And I was so pumped that I was going to have like the energy from my team just cheering me on. So I got to the pool, I did my normal routine. And the thing I remember the most about the Olympics is that, you know, now they give you a little bit more freedom to move around the ready room, but they made us sit in those chairs. They numbered the chairs to go along with what lane you were going to be. And you had to sit in the chair for like 20 minutes before your race. And they're really and close together. Like, You're like right next to these people. Oh, lane four and lane, uh, no, 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 it was lane five and lane seven were elbowing me, just like trying to knock me around. I was like, come on. <laughs> but lucky for me, Amanda was in lane eight. So we were kind of leaning forward and talking to each other. And then like a few minutes before we were getting ready to march out, the girl in lane five decides she needs to go to the bathroom and she goes to the bathroom and the lock broke to the bathroom. And all we hear is like her pounding on the door, like, help, help. We're like, move her in, one down. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> but they actually had to delay. Like, you know, they're so strict about oh, yeah. that timeline. You will march out on this minute. And our, we were, we threw the timeline off because they couldn't get her out of the bathroom. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so we finally march out. Her face is bright red and the thing I really remember most about before that race was just looking over and Team USA was there. And it just was such a comfort and just really, really, really like put me in the right headspace to like, come on, let's do this. You've got, you know, your friends and your family behind you. Uh, I love it. I, I remember cheering that night. I remember helping lead cheers. That was my favorite thing to do is just get, get us going. And no one leads a cheer like you lead a cheer, I, Josh. I, <laughs> no I get a little goofy. I know. And, uh, 
<laughs> I get excited, but um, it, it was a special team because we had so many uh, just wonderful people, Lenny Kraselberg and you and Misty and Gary Hall Jr. and uh, Amanda. And we just, we just had a blast. And, you know, when the, <clears throat> the first day the Aussies really showed up well, and then the second day we responded back with going one, two in the 400 IM. And then we kind of were on a roll after that. And, uh, I think we won 33 medals, which was the highest total up, up until I think Rio, Rio just nudged us by like 34, the 2016 team. So 2000 oh was one of the strongest USA yeah. teams ever. Yes, it was. I mean, I just remember swimming that race and just the feeling of when you hit the wall, like even before you know if you win a medal, just feeling like the weight of the world has just lifted off your shoulders because you did your best. You've competed to the fullest extent that you can. You put everything into it. And just knowing that, okay, let's see what happened. Like I, I gave it on my all. Let's see what happened. I can't change it. I lo- and when I turned around and I saw a number two behind my name, I lost my mind. I actually like free I start. I don't remember any of this, but I've seen it on a recording. The next day we went to the Today Show and I'll never forget. They looked at me. We were with a massive group of people. Jason Lezak is standing behind me and they looked at me and they were like, mic her up. And Jason goes, what did you do? I'm like, oh my God. What did I do? And they showed, they said, okay, we're going to show the most dramatic reaction to anyone winning a medal at this Olympic so far. And they're like, roll the tape. And I just saw myself and it looked like I was trying to cover my mouth and fist pump at the same time. And they asked me, they said, Christy, it looked like you were trying to communicate in sign language (laughs) to someone in the stands. Do you know sign language? Who speaks sign language? I was like, oh my God. I was just like, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. Any of that. <laughs> I just remember crying and like not being able to stop crying because I was so happy and standing on the award podium. Like you have to stop crying. People are going to think you're upset. <laughs> but I could not, I could not stop bawling. And because I realized it, you know, that medal to me does not mean, I mean, it does, but it doesn't mean you got second place at the Olympics. It means that no matter what was thrown at me, no matter what, you know, adversity I had to overcome and, and what challenges I had is that I never stopped believing. Sure, I may have had to reset my goals and I may have had to, you know, reset my timeline, but at the end of the day, I always knew what I wanted to do, what I wanted to accomplish, and I never gave up. I love that. that. Never stop believing, never give up, and good things can happen. Oh, I love that. So you got an individual silver medal. I got a uh, silver medal in the relays that week. So we share that we share the same color medal, but it's really special to get an individual one. I got fourth that, that, that week in my individual race. And that was kind of a bitter pill to, to just miss a medal. But, uh, but, but you know what that feels like, but you got, but you got the silver medal and, uh, did you stick around and decide to train for another four years after that? Yeah, I did. So I, I remember seeing Jack and Bowerly, who was one of the coaches in Sydney, and I saw him in the hallway and I was like, That's, that was fun. Let's do this again. <laughs> Once I stopped crying, I was, he was like, I thought you might say that. And, you know, the next four years were training. I stayed at Georgia. I was still training and I was also doing student teaching, which whew, it's like working. Of, it's like being an actual teacher and then trying to practice at the same time. And I remember days where I was teaching fifth grade and going to practice, knowing I was getting there late and just wanting to pull over on the side of the road and just take a 10 minute nap, just like anything. I was so tired and I would get to practice and I would miss the entire warm up. I would miss the, the preset and jump into threshold, like cold Turkey. It was brutal, but I did really well for the next, uh, in th- through 2002. And then in 2003, um, I went, I remember going to Charlotte ultra swim and I swam the 200 and there was actually a moment in the race where I didn't physically feel like I was going to make it to the wall. I just felt like I was, I had mono or something was going on and I got out of the pool and I walk over to Jack and you know, Jack, when he's mad, he gets his vein going in his forehead and I saw the vein and I just knew that I was like, Oh no, I had gone something like 15 seconds off my best time, which I had never done in my life, like never. And he looked at me and he was just like, Oh, are you okay? And you know, we, we were doing the lactic acid testing and usually I could clear lactic acid in, in warming down in five minutes. And it was 45 minutes later and I'm still warming down and my lactic acid's going up. Mm. And I'll never forget. G was like, you should, 
have her go to the doctor. And I did. And I thought I had mono or I thought something was going on. And I had, they were basically like, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Like your body is done. So I remember not wanting to go to world championships that summer because you know, my resting heart rate was normally in the fifties. And when I would wake up in the morning, I would have to take my heart rate every morning. And if it was above like 70, I wasn't supposed to get in the pool. And I would swim one lap of practice for warm up the first lap. And my heart rate was like wow. 190. It was insane. <clears throat> it was horrible. So I went to world championships that summer in 2003 and I ended up not even making the finals in the 200 mm. breast. And with you know, 15 meters to go, I, all I wanted to do was hang on to that lane line and just fall asleep. It was so bad. I did pretty well in 50 because, you know, anybody can do, you can do that splash and dash, no matter how tired you are, you can, um, you can do that 50. And I ended up doing pretty well. And I loved it because in Barcelona, um, you know, there was a lot going on in the world at that time. And I'd walked out in night. I was sponsored by Nike and Nike gave me the Barcelona uh, jersey <laughs> with my name oh, on the wow. back of it. And the crowd went insane. And USA swimming was like, mm, maybe wear your warm up next time, Christy. I was like, but they loved it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was a really hard, that was one of the hardest meets I've ever gone through in my life. Just like the disappointment and just the heartbreak of it, just not even making it into finals. And then Amanda, who I loved swimming with Amanda Beard. She's one of my favorite people that I ever got to swim with. And I stood in the stands and watched her break my American record. And I sat, I remember climbing into the stands with my parents and sitting there and all of a sudden, my picture, I'm sure the people um, on the cameras were like, oh, look, cute. A girl in her swimsuit got out of a race and is sitting with her parents with her arms around her. Let's put her on the Jumbotron. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like heartbroken. I remember Debbie Phelps like putting a heat sheet over my face so that they wouldn't show me anymore. It was like, oh, it was one of the hardest things I, you know, one of the hardest competitions I had been to. And that's saying a lot <laughs> after the two third places at trials. But I had a year to try to kind of recover and just get my body, you know, back. And so I ended up swimming at trials in 2004 and I ended up getting third oh. place again. Um, but this time I know, <laughs> and I was so close. I needed like five more feet <laughs> to the wall, but this time it was different because I had made it back right. to third from not even, you know, feeling like I was going to finish a 200 brushstroke a year earlier. And so it was totally a different perspective for me. It wasn't, oh my gosh, I missed the team. It was, look how far I've yeah. come. Uh, and then after that, they're like, okay, Christy, back to drug testing for you as an alternate. And I'm like, no, I retire. I'm done. <laughs> That's not how it works. Uh, but the coolest thing happened is I ended up packing up from Georgia. I moved back home to Pennsylvania. And then right before the Olympics, I got a call from Colorado Springs. I was like, this is my moment. I'm getting called up. <laughs> Put me in. I'm ready. I thought, you know, something had happened. Um, but it turns out that there was a spot open for world championships in 2004, Shore Course Worlds, which were going to be in October after the Olympics. And they asked me if I wanted to compete. And I had just moved home. I didn't have a place to train. I didn't have anywhere. And I was like, yes. 100%. I'll figure the rest out. I just, it was an opportunity for me to finish my career on my terms. And you swim at Olympic trials, not knowing if that's your last race or if that's going to be, you know, if you're going to make the Olympics. And um, for me to get to go to world championships was just the perfect way to end my career. And then my team voted me to be a captain. And you know, I mean, you are Captain America, Josh, like you are the like, ultimate captain of team USA. So being named a captain was just something very special and the perfect way to just, end uh, my I love that. What a great bonus to, to finish like that. What, what city was that world's in, in 2004? Oh, that was in oh, Indianapolis. Right. So that was when they put, yeah, they built the pool on top of the, the Pacers yes. basketball court. <laughs> and oh my gosh, I'll never forget swimming. I was warming up and I was doing backstroke and I was so just in awe of what was happening that I missed the flags, just swam head first into the wall. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. You know, just it was the coolest thing and it was the best way to go out, just knowing like I was able to soak up every minute of it. Like I swam in prelims and I thought, you know, this might be it or I might make it to finals. I made it to finals and just 
remembering to enjoy every single. Uh, I love that. I love that. What a great career for Team USA. Um, What a just lots of records, lots of good medals, lots of good memories. Uh, That's awesome. And what I what I really appreciate about you is that you transition so well. Because uh, transitions are hard for all of us because, you know, your swimming is your world. It's your identity. It's your people group. It gives you so much structure and significance and joy. And then to transition into a real regular job is kind of tricky because, you know, where do you find that camaraderie and that sense of purpose and that sense of, you know, you put your head at the pillow at the end of, at the, end of the day and you're like, yeah, I did this. You know, so it's, it's, fi- it's difficult to find yeah. that in real life. But teaching is a very special job where you kind of get some of that because, you know, if you have great teachers and great administrators and great kids and you work hard, it really is satisfying. And you spent 14 years giving back to the kids of your hometown. And I got to tell you, if I had you as a third grade teacher, I would be thanking God. I would be like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing in the world. (laughs) Those those guys and girls must have loved you. They were hilarious. I, you know, third grade is just such a fun age. They're eight and they're nine and they say what they're thinking and they still love you. They're not too cool for school yet. And I'll never forget trying to teach my third grade um, about tenths and hundredths. And just trying to explain to them, you know, you know, they would come to school and they're like, oh, Ms. Kowal, you know, our mom told us you're an Olympian. You know, they did not watch me swim. Yeah. They're babies. <laughs> Maybe they saw something on YouTube. But um, uh, the one kiddo, I, I showed my race from, I think, Olympic trials. And I was trying to explain what a hundredth or what a tenth looked like. And it was like my first year of teaching. And I showed it. And I showed how we basically hit the wall at the same time. And... Um, there was silence. And I said, now do we understand what tenths and hundredths are? And this little boy, I'll never forget him. Brian Weaver looked at me, he goes, Miss Cole. I'm like, yes, Brian, do you have a question? He goes, no, Miss Cole, you blew it. And I'm like, oh! <laughs> and the class was just like, oh, and his mom, when I told the story, laughed so hard. I was like, Mr. Weaver, do you like third grade? Would you like to repeat third grade? <laughs> And I went home and my mom's like, and I was just talking to my mom this week and she's like, I think that's the first time you ever really like processed how close you came sometimes to things. I'm like, yeah, I did. But for me, it was awesome going right. You know, of course I struggled with the end of my career. Like anyone does you lose, it is, it's like losing a family and it's losing that support system. But I was lucky to find that with, uh, with my, my school that I went to teach at. I actually taught in the same uh, school that I had sixth grade, I went to sixth grade in, and I ended up teaching in the same room that I had sixth grade math wow. in. And my mentor teacher and I, from the minute I met her, I knew like she's one of my best friends. And I had in her what I had in my teammates in Georgia. And over time, meeting the other teachers and my third grade team, there were four of us that we taught with, and we were just such a tight group of people that we could finish each other's sentences and we could play off of each other. And we were just creatively able to work together so well. And I really found what I was missing from swimming Mm. in that group. That's, that's so cool. Well, I just so appreciate how you made every team you've been on better at Georgia, the team USA and, uh, your school that you, that you got to work at. And, and now, even though you're a Pennsylvania girl, you're now over on the West coast and I am, I am in Long Beach, California, home of the 2004 Olympic right. trials. That's right. So <laughs> the, the ocean was calling yeah. you, I think, right? It was, it was, I'm, you know, there's just something so like healing and soothing about being near the ocean and, and just seeing the waves and the, I started actually, I don't swim too much in a pool. I do a lot of open water swimming now, and I have such an appreciation for what those open water swimmers it's do. Tough. You got to have a whole <laughs> nother mindset. I mean, they are tough as nails. Cause I, just, oh, 20 minutes feels like three hours. Like it's just weird. Exactly. <laughs> Everything touches you. You're like, oh my God, shark. Yeah. No, I, did, I did one, I did, I did one open water oh, race yeah. back in Malibu, I think 98 and it was 20 minutes. It was me and Lenny Kraselberg and Brad Schumacher racing and Bobby racing each other. And, uh, I won, I beat those guys. Thankfully they're all sprinters, but, um, it was 20 minutes and I thought it took like two hours. It was, I was like, this is it. This is the last one I ever do. Yep. Um, 
but yeah, yeah. But God bless oh, those yeah. water guys and gals. Um, so you now get to teach kids, um, you know, through clinics, through the, the local groups. And um, I, I, I just so am so thankful you're able to share your experiences with today's young people. And uh, what what advice do you give to kids and parents now that? Um, <clears throat> Oh, yeah. So I, you know, I think just the things that I've learned along the way, my own experiences, my own stories combined with all of my teaching experience, um, it's really given me a good foundation for like child development and just how to support children through their swimming. So I actually just did uh, a workshop this past Friday on supporting, for, it was called Parents in the Game Supporting from the Sidelines. And it was just really how to foster that growth mindset and goal setting and sportsmanship in your children and one of my, the biggest lessons that I love teaching is the biggest lesson that I probably learned in swimming. So aside of American records and world records and everything is just having that attitude of gratitude is a game changer. And, you know, people who show gratitude are just more resilient and they're able to look at the big picture. And I don't think I really learned, um, the import, I, I, I grew up, my parents had me growing up thanking everyone for everything. You know, I, we go to a restaurant, somebody puts something down. Thank you, ma'am. Every, thank you, sir. Every single time. But I don't think I realized how much a thank you meant to someone else, uh, until, so at Olympic trials, the coolest thing in India was your name. When you made the team, your name went up on the wall. And, um, so you got to have your name on this massive wall at the IUPUI natatorium. And there was a man named Jay Sewell who would go up and hand freehand calligraphy, everyone's names. And I happened to be there the morning he was writing my name on, on the wall. And I ran over to him like a crazy person. And I was like, Oh my gosh, sir, that's my name. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And he looked at me and was like, okay, <laughs> lady. Um, and then that night I came back to finals and Jack was like, uh, they want to see you over by the wall of names. And I was just like, Oh no, what did I do? Like, what did, who did I offend? And Mr. Sewell took me up in the lift and inside the O of Kowal, there was a diamond penciled in or penciled in an outline. And he told me I was going to paint that red. Now it doesn't matter if you've broken a world record, American record, anything, there's no other markings on anyone's name on that wall. And so I'm terrified of, you know, being up there. I'm afraid I'm going to drop the paintbrush and ruin the entire wall. So I managed to shakily paint this in and I, and I asked him why I had my name, uh, with a diamond in the, O. Oh, and he said that out of all the names on the wall, I was the only person to wow. ever thank him. And so, you know, all of these lessons that we learn through this, the sport of swimming and we learn how to, you know, communicate and we learn perseverance and hard work and dedication and determination. Um, but coming out of swimming, I think the biggest thing I took with me is just how much an attitude of gratitude and how far that will take you and how much it means to other people to, to say thank you, not just to text them thank you, but like a verbal thank you or a handwritten note. And I, I, that's something that I've carried with me for the rest, of my, you know, the rest of my life. Attitude of gratitude goes a long way. And it really is the key to so much. So I love that story. I didn't know they, they let you up in the lift to paint, to paint it. Oh, yeah. I'll, show you. I'll send you the picture. <laughs> There's a picture of me up there. I <laughs> yep. I painted I love that. that. I love that. Yeah, because when I was there uh, about a year ago, I remember taking that picture of your name up there. And I was like, and I had forgotten for a second. I was like, why does Christy have the diamond? I know she's awesome, but what's the diamond? She's the only one that has the diamond. And, and, but yeah, that guy loved that you took the time to say thank you. And all of us need to take take that time to, to thank the people that have helped helped us succeed in life and get where we are. So I love I love your message so much. A um, little quick lightning round of your favorite things before we send you off. Your favorite color. Okay. Cool. Uh, Blue. Favorite pre-race meal. I, Arby's. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, kids. <laughs> there's, no, there's an, there is actually healthy ways to eat. So if you think of it, it's you know bread, it's roast beef. I did, I got like a baked potato. Didn't always get a coke with it. I would get water with it. So there's a healthy way to do it. But it was, yeah. I was very well. You know, Arby's has a great turkey <laughs> sandwich. It's one of the best fast food sandwiches out there. And then then the regular the regular roast beef one is is fine. So. Do you know how hard it is to find an Arby's in California? Oh, 
<laughs> that's cool. Yeah, we got them a lot over here in Oklahoma and Texas. But uh, I just think that's so funny that that's your favorite pre-race meal. I love that. Favorite favorite city you've ever been to? Oh gosh, it's a tie between Rome oh, and cool. Sydney. That's cool. Um, and finally, favorite event other than breaststroke? Oh, this is hard. Little known fact, I used to get to swim on the mm. 200 free relay at Georgia. And so, you know, it was very confusing for coaches who saw me. They would look at me and be like, this is freestyle. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> look at me. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I actually made the final of the 50 free at the Charlotte Ultra Swim, like Jenny, Dara, Amy, because I was in the lane with the current in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at me, they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, yeah, I made it. So maybe the I 53. Love that. I love that. Yeah, get a picture of that heat with you and that heat. That would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> I was like, maybe I should just do my brush stroke. <laughs> uh, well, that's, I love how you're able to have such a wonderful message and you're a master clinician. That means you can teach all four strokes. We're one of the best on the planet at it. And so people can get hold of you through the, through the clinics and what's your, how, what's your Instagram yeah. handle that people can. My Instagram is that's at easy. Christy Cobalt. And, and so. Yep. You and I get to help out every four years with the Olympic trials training camp. It's, it's one of the yes, most unique um, camps in the world. It only happens during the Omaha Olympic trials. And you and I and a few other Olympic friends, we get to coach the, the kids. There's thousands of kids that come to Olympic trials to cheer on friends and family. And they, us, they, those swimmers, they can't miss eight days of practice. They have to stay in shape. And so you and Jason, Lezak and I, we coach those kids in the morning and then go to the stadium to watch the folks make the team. So you get to train with us Olympians and then go watch the new Olympians make the team. It's like the vacation of a lifetime. And it is a swimmer vacation dream. I look forward to, you know, as soon as an Olympics was over, so as soon as Rio was you know, the Olympic trials was over. I was like, okay, four years, let's do this. I'm ready for, I'm ready for camp next time. <laughs> it is so yeah. much fun. It's just so if you guys so want to train with Christy and I and the other Olympic gang, you need to be at Omaha June 13th through 21st of 2021. It's now Tokyo 21. So of course, trials are now June and then the Olympics are late July in Tokyo. And now you've, you've been able to go watch a few Olympics. What are the Olympics you've been to just to cheer and be, a, be an ambassador? Oh, just, I went, yeah, I went to London and that was the first time I, I got to go to an Olympics and I was planning on going to Rio, but it kind of fell through at the last minute. But watching the Olympics is my mom. She was like, I can't wait for you to go to watch the Olympics and see what it's like when people are not catering to you and carting you around. <laughs> She's like, you need to go see the experience as a spectator. And it was just phenomenal. I am a history buff. So I ran around London going on every museum tour that there possibly was. Um, but I was there the night Rebecca Sony broke the world record and won the gold medal in the 200 breaststroke. And I thought I was going to pass out from cheering so hard for her. <laughs> it was such an amazing experience. And it's crazy because it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. I mean, I was talking to Missy Franklin's parents this, you know, this past week, and we all talked about how we were at basically the top seat in the house as far away from the pool as you possibly can get. So you can't tell who's who. Everybody looks like a teeny tiny little ant swimming down the pool. But, um, you know, just the energy of it is just, you know, the Olympic spirit, they talk about the Olympic spirit and, and it is just something that will just get in your soul and never leave. And just to be able to go and watch other people pursue their dreams and, and just live out some of the happiest moments of their life. It's just something to, you know, if you can ever, if you guys ever have the chance to get to a, an Olympics and watch the event, LA 2028, come on out. Um, but it's, I cannot wait to watch another Olympics live. It's just the energy and the energy of the entire event is something that is unlike anything uh, I've ever yeah. experienced. You're, everybody needs to watch an Olympic games. Everybody should be able to watch an Olympics or Olympic trials with Christy Kowal. Cause you're the best cheerleader out there. 
but, uh, <laughs> no, I just, I learned by watching you, Josh. I learned by watching you. <laughs> yeah. It's so fun to see people do their best and, uh, and go for it. It's always exciting. And, um, so I'm, I'm so thankful we've got to share so many experiences together in the swimming world and I'm excited for more and I can't wait to when pools open back up and we can get doing clinics again with, and um, so yes. I know I'll see you around a pool soon and for those of you guys out there you want to train with Trist, Christy and I during the trials training camp you can just google tr trials training camp and uh, the website will come right up and uh, so there's plenty of registrations open to come have the vacation of a lifetime with Christy and I and other Olympians at Omaha next June. So Christy, thanks for being on the show and thanks for being an ultimate swimmer. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor and it's always so much fun to get yeah, to hang out we'll with see you, you Josh. Soon. Have a great one. Bye-bye. You too. Take care. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your Ultimate Swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.